Hello, all. Welcome to the Chicago Justice Podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Siska. I'm also executive director of the Chicago Justice Project. You can find out more about what we do at chicagojustice.org. Get involved at cjpnation.org. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, season three, episode 19. Today, we focus on the Juvenile Temporary Detention Center, and we talk with Kelly Garcia and Carlos Bellesteros from Injustice Watch and talk about their coverage of the Juvenile Temporary Detention Center or juvenile, basically juvenile prison for more or juvenile jails, I think is a better way to put it, in Cook County. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, you want to support our work, go into the show notes and you'll in the notes and you will see a link to our Patreon. We'd really appreciate it. Please, please keep a close watch on our YouTube channel as we're just gonna, we're just starting to rev up production there um, coming up in the next couple of days well you're going to see things in our fop watch you're going to see things on the bad new bad good news coverage of crime and justice issues that's already in the can so that should be up in a day or two but that is definitely going to be we're going to be pumping out content to our youtube channel if you're watching this on youtube smash the subscribe and like buttons really appreciate it if you're listening to the pod Please hit subscribe and go to our YouTube channel, subscribe and like the videos. We'd really appreciate it. Also on our Patreon this week, or actually last week we started explainer videos that are going to be exclusively available on our Patreon for a period of time. And also the behind the scenes videos, which are going to be strictly um, available on our Patreon. Um, Our first explainer was about defining violent crime in Chicago. I know it's a joke that you have to do that, but hey, politics gets in the way and um, yesterday, this last Monday, we just published our uh, first in a while behind the scenes. You get a kind of um, behind behind the curtain look at our ongoing litigation um, in Cook County against Cook County State Attorney's Office, Illinois Department of Corrections, Metropolitan Police Department here in D.C., where I'm coming to you from, and um, a little bit in the upcoming litigation, but that's going to be a future video because we have a few more lawsuits to file soon. So let's get to today's show. Like I said, we're talking about, and you're going to hear the acronym JTDC. It's a juvenile temporary detention center in Cook County. Um, It has been under the chief judge's purview and control forever. It has been um, a disaster for forever. It is less of a disaster now than it used to be. Um, How... I know you'll you'll understand when you listen to this video, like wow, they're doing some bad things. It used to be worse under previous Cook County Board presidents, Todd Stroger. I'm sure it was under, um, I, I forgot uh, Stroger Senior, but I'm sure it definitely happened under Todd Stroger. And I know there are all kinds of investigations about it, but it, uh, juvenile temporary detention center under Todd Stroger was a dumping ground for what I would call. I don't know. I don't know if this is mean or not, but call people who aren't very smart and don't have any work ethic. How's that? And there was a dumping ground for people that could, that worked on campaigns and needed payback, but could not actually be clouded in anyone's of tens of thousands of county jobs, right? They were just, um, didn't have any work ethic, were totally unqualified for any ground. So they dumped them in the juvenile temporary detention center. That under Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle has cleaned up. The population has shrunk, which is also a good thing. Sadly, like I said, it is better than it used to be, but it still ain't good. And there's a big reason to like, um, a big reason. There's a lot of reasons to, you know, call into question why it should not just be shut down or taken over by the feds. Maybe it probably should just be shut down. So we have the honor today to talking, like I said, it's Kelly Garcia and Carlos Bellesteros about their coverage of the JTDC at Injustice Watch. And uh, we're going to get to that conversation, and I will be back with you after the interview. Thank you. Kelly Garcia, Carlos Bellesteros, thank you so much for jumping on with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. All right, Kelly, I'm going to start with you. Can you just tell our audience a little bit what is the Juvenile Temporary Detention Center? 
Yeah, sure. So the Cook County Juvenile Detention Center um, is the county countywide detention center for teenagers starting at the age of 13 all the way to 18 who are um, usually held pretrial um, for, you know, whatever charge they're facing. Um, they're, the detention center is usually filled with uh, kids who are mostly Black. Um, half of them have um, a disability, so they're required to get special education services. Um, and again, most of them are, are held pre-trial. Um, so the Juvenile Detention Center has been under a lot of scrutiny in recent years for um, their their use of restraint and, and excessive use of confinement, um, which is obviously the topic today, but um, that's been a reoccurring problem over the years. Um, uh, because of that, um, the number of, of young people inside the detention center has gone down, um, but um, not so much the, the, the use of um, restraint and confinement. So um, that's kind of the, um, you know, that's kind of like a summary of, of the detention center. Carlos, is there anything you want to add? No, I would just say to give context, I just looked up the uh, population numbers from last week. It seems about like 160 youth uh, were held as of last week at the juvenile detention center. And like Kelly said, 80% uh, of them are black. Uh, most of them are uh, males and they, uh, most of them are also between the ages of 15 and 17. And they're usually held for like an average of 30 days. So usually like a month. So Carlos is the, the, the um, it's Cook County. So the answer to this has to be no, but I am assuming the juvenile temporary detention center does not have a history of high quality management. Am I, am I wrong on that? Well, uh, what we can definitely say is that management at the Cook County Detention Center has been routinely criticized for a number of issues and for a long time. Uh, so much so that advocates uh, who are uh, working with youth, uh, both advocates and lawyers working with youth in detain at the detention center and, and also that follow up with them in the months after their detention have come out and said that the county needs to close down the juvenile temporary detention center and transition towards a more uh, community community based uh, uh, system in which you know 150 160 teenagers aren't uh, put into this five story fortress that uh, experts said in several reports now isn't suitable to uh, hold youth uh, in this way. Kelly, can you give us a, you know, a snapshot of what um, types of charges the youth are most likely facing that are held in, in the JTDC? Yeah, so they're mostly held for like serious charges because it's not always the first thing that happens after a child's arrest. It's like there's a, there's other options for what happens when an officer arrests a teenager. Um, usually they they you know, they might sometimes just get sent home, but other times they get sent to the detention center for more serious charges. Um, so you might see, you know, carjacking or, um, you know, other other types of serious charges. Um, but again, it's not the it's usually not the first stop um, if, if a kid's arrested. Um, is that right, Carlos? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think to Kelly's point earlier, the population at the detention center has been uh, coming down over the last decade. Um, but, st but still, uh, advocates say that the detention center itself, which uh, for listeners and viewers might recognize it if you ever drive past like Roosevelt and Ogden, um, it's across from the FBI building, uh, it, you know, right there in the, and try Taylor. Uh, yeah, even though the population has been falling, uh, the, the detention center itself is not suitable to hold youth. Uh, and the experts argue that it's counterproductive, that oftentimes uh, kids and teens who are held there uh, come out with, uh, or come out with more issues to hand, more issues to deal with or exacerbated emotional and uh, mental health issues uh, made worse by their stint at the detention center. Okay, so if we look a little bit back, let's say April of 21, 
Judge Evans creates this blue ribbon committee just days ahead of the JTDC advisory board and report recommendations that are coming out. The appointment of blue ribbon committee advisory board also follows the Chicago Reporter reporting on this and the Center on Children's Law and Policy. So you have all of that action. What meaningful action at that point happened? What meaningful change, if any, happened to the JTDC at that point? Carlos, I'll start with you, I guess. So, uh, you know, if, if according to the chief judge's office, and this is like uh, based mostly on our most recent reporting, so I'm not sure about the timeline here, but every time one of these reports come out criticizing the the inner workings of the uh, JTDC, uh, the chief judge, Chief Judge Evans, and his office come out with either a call for more investigating of the issue or sometimes some policy decisions as to, to make some changes inside. And one of the most, for example, one of the most recent changes they made, uh, uh, and this was in response to another report that came out more recently, uh, was some programmatic changes that uh, emphasize, a kind of, that would have a greater emphasis on mental health and kind of like therapeutic practices um, and having like, group cohorts come together, uh, led by like a black psychologist that they hired. Um, and and, that, and, and this, these policy changes were in response to a report that said that like a lot of the, a lot of the youth were spending their days just kind of without any programming whatsoever or min very minimal programming that a lot of their, uh, that a lot of their structured time was basically spent sitting against the wall and reading the same worksheet over and over. And so the chief judge responded by, you know, making these programmatic changes, but ultimately it's really hard for us as journalists to uh, get a sense of like how things are changing on the inside or how, or the, the, the pace at which things are changing because the judiciary here in the state of Illinois is not subject to FOIA, uh, to the Freedom of Information Act, which means we can't ask for things like, give us the daily schedule of this person who was detained here or tell us how many people are you hiring to do this or that. Um, a lot of basic information that would help us have a clear picture of what's going on is um, ultimately not something we can request from the chief judge. So um, it's tough to say really what's changed inside, to be honest. Now, I guess I'm gonna to go to Kelly for this, but it seems to me that the lack of transparency there helps the judge, right? This is, and helps the people running the JTDC so they don't have to be transparent and worry about people like you guys sticking your heads in and finding out what's going on. That seems to be a, is that a, I guess my question would be, do you think that's a choice by the chief judge to keep things opaque there? I mean, I think, you know, I can't, I can't speak to why exactly, you know, they, they, they can't be transparent, but I, I can say that the problems that we have with data that, that pertains to, to youth across the state always comes back to, um, you know, being minors, right? And that's, that's always been an issue in, in other aspects too, but um, a lot of the times we have to rely on inspections and audit reports from the state, or we have to depend on um, like independent groups for for data that comes out of the out of the um, judiciary, especially from the chief judge's office and the juvenile detention center. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, I can't really say why exactly the you know the chief judge can't can't really say other than they're just following. Um, you know, whatever protocols they have, and and most likely it's because they're children, right? Um, you know, they can't, if they do release data, they can't release names or other identifiable information. Um, and that, you know, that to me makes sense. Um, but at the end of the day, like, we also need to understand the conditions um, inside the detention center. And I think that's something that we've been struggling to get. Um, yeah. It's, I would also add that it, that it is bigger than you know, Chief Judge Evans uh, here in Cook County, because the blocking of the judiciary from uh, access through FOIA uh, is statewide. Um, and state lawmakers haven't had the appetite to change that in the law. Uh, for example, during this latest uh, session in Springfield, um, there was a bill 
uh, that was introduced that would open the judiciary uh, to FOIA requests here in Illinois, but it didn't go anywhere. So unfortunately, uh, whether or not Chief Judge Evans like, likes to have it opaque here in Cook County or like keeps to likes the, the fact that we can't access a lot of things through FOIA, um, the state prohibits him, prohibits us and them from doing so anyway. So uh, unfortunately, it is a bigger issue than just Cook County. But before we get to the equip for equity or equip for equality report and some of your early, your current reporting, previously there seems to, you guys have seemed to have documented um, just the massive use of isolation at the JTDC, right? They have these sleep hours, at least what you've documented from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Um, and then they're locked down an hour for shift changes. So, Carlos, to what degree were they using isolation, and how and how um, and how prevalent was it? Right. So, um, the so the report you're referencing, the Equip for Equality report, um, really tried to answer this question very thoroughly. The so just to clear, Equip for Equality is a outside. Uh, group of lawyers um, hired or like designated by the state to be its chief investigator when it comes to issues around the JTTC and other issues surrounding pr primarily youth with learning disabilities and other forms of, and other disabilities. And so this group has really uh, unrivaled access to this facility because they are basically coming in with a government mandate, allowing them to pour over all the records, pour over, interview as many people as they want. Uh, and so this report is ex extremely thorough. It was 96 pages in all. And their findings were uh, that the staff at the JTDC was using isolation practices uh, pretty consistently. Uh, and that the data around how often and for how long was very inconsistent. Uh, uh, thanks in part due to the fact that the staff at the detention center wouldn't call leaving kids isolated. Uh, they wouldn't refer to these practices as isolation or you know as solitary confinement. You know that the the chief judge and the JTDC staff take a firm stance that they don't practice solitary confinement. Uh, but what investigators found when they went in and interviewed kids was that they were still being uh, left very isolated for extended periods of time uh, in their cells or in their pods, depending on which pod they were in, because that's how the JTC operates. It's separated into these pod systems that are pred predicated by disciplinary action. And so if a kid acts out in a certain way, then they're placed into these like higher restrictive pods. And what investigators found was that in these like disciplinary pods was the was the instance of the most isolation. So you had kids, as investigators describe it, sitting against the wall, uh, like sitting against any wall or a chair, uh, working on worksheets for hours, no real enrichment or uh, any other kind of. Uh, uh, programs available to them uh, and that they would often spend days on this kind of cycle where they would go to their cells to sleep, go to breakfast, maybe take a gym class and then go back to this disciplinary pod where, and, and then they would they actually, they would have all that stuff happening within their pod. And, and one of the other findings and I'll leave and I'll pass it on to Kelly uh, w was that because they, the, the, the youth detained here do everything within their pod, depending on how they're disciplined. Sometimes the kids in like the very high disciplinary pods would be alone without any other kind of uh, other youth for a, a very long time. Um, so they would be eating dinner, eating breakfast, doing all their school stuff alone or mostly alone. Um, and so the investigators determined that this was extremely deprivational and counterproductive to the well-being of these youth. Uh, Kelly, I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, um, in the same in the same report from Equip for Equality, 
and, and just to add to, to this topic on, on confinement, um, the practice of sitting on the wall, one of the report mentions one student who, um, you know, said that he had, you know, had they attempted suicide, um, because of how long they had spent sitting on the wall. Right. And so this is, these are the type of, you know, incidents that were, that they're, you know, facing um, inside the detention center. But another thing that the report noted as well was the use of physical restraint. Um, the report mentioned um, these rovers, um, which were really like a rapid response team that respond to like crises or incidents. Um, in many cases, um, they were responding to incidents such as like a, a, you know, a kid who was, you know, getting rowdy or, um, you know, just, you know, doing, not doing what they're told or whatever, but not really um, a, a danger to the others, to the other kids, but they were still being called to respond to these incidents. And in many of these incidents, they were using um, physical restraint, um, in some cases, like prone restraint. So when you literally have your head, um, you know, face down against the floor, which is dangerous. Um, many of these kids, um, come out injured from these incidents. Um, one kid, uh, the report noted had a seizure during one of these incidents. Um, so these rovers are, uh, people that the kids are, are scared of inside the detention center. Um, and so what I thought was interesting um, after we published the story, or actually, you know, when we were about to publish the story, the response that we got from the chief judge was that, um, well, the investigators should have told us who the kids were that were complaining about these incidents and about these rovers, right? Like they should have gotten the names, um, which is ironic because in the report, um, the kids themselves told investigators that they were too afraid to complain um, about the rovers. Um, I think one quote literally said, um, ain't no snitching on the rovers. Um, so that's that's a kind of level of fear that the kids are, are you know, you know, operating under from from these rovers and, and from just a use of, of restraint inside the detention center. Um, and then the other allegations, too, were that um the detention center lacks uh, special education services, which you've reported on in the past. Um, they don't have the mandated uh, teachers. They don't have the right programming um, for kids with learning disabilities. Um, and that there's also no um, accessibility for kids who, who have uh, physical disabilities as well. And Am I wrong? Uh, quickly, I would say- yeah. Oh, sorry. Just, uh, just to uh, re re underline this like lack of FOIA point here. Uh, if, for example, we were interested in in seeing and like requesting these grievance reports from the JTDC filed by youth detained against some of the rovers, or if we wanted to see any disciplinary action, internal disciplinary action taken against any rover or anyone on staff, uh, that's the kind of stuff we would be able to request if FOIA. Uh, applied to the judiciary here in Cook County in Illinois, which took control of the JTDC in the 90s, which was not always in the control of the chief judge. But since it is now in the control of the chief judge, then it's, you know, we, it's a black box. We can't access those kinds of things. Yeah, it, I have um, years and years of doing research in Chicago and Cook County. I've always had um, rather horrific um, interactions trying to get court records. Um, I once had to get into um, at 26th Street at the court, the criminal court in Chicago. They were hiding a file. I can see his face, but the name will come to me. Jeremiah Miraday's criminal trial, which was probably before your times here, but um, he was found not guilty very quickly. And the a couple of days later, I went to get the criminal file and the, they were running me around at different courtrooms. And finally, I made a scene and started screaming for the head of the office to come out. And she did. And I said, please tell me where this file is and who I sue, because I'm going to sue and it's going to be you. You're in charge. Where is the file? It's a public record. Stop hiding it. And she's like, it's being kept by the judge that handled the case in his office. There's nothing we can do about it. Mm -hmm. The judge was hiding the criminal file. Right. And like it was a public oh, yeah. hearing and there were all kinds of reporters in there. They all saw it, but they didn't want to release the file and the clerk's office went along with it. And I eventually got to see it because I went to the judge's office and just said, you know, do you want me to sue you for the file? But it's just so I can only imagine how much worse it must get in one of their detention facilities. 
Ah, it's just disgusting. Yeah. Especially when you're talking about kids, it just gets worse. So, Kelly, I'm going to go back to you on this. This doesn't sound, the JTDC doesn't sound very therapeutic. Correct. I mean, it's on. <laughs> right. This is just like trying to meet the dis, the, the misbehavior by these kids with force. And, and that's what, I mean, not to, uh, it, it, it's just, that's, that's the defense that the superintendent of the JTDC, Leonard Dixon, that's the defense he takes. Anytime he gets criticized about any of this stuff, he comes out and says, we are a jail for youth. We hold them for however long we have to hold them, a couple of days, a couple of weeks. And that's our job. Our job is not to rehabilitate them, uh, which is the contention between experts and him uh, who say, you know, the county should do more to in the rehabilitation sense, not just the detention sense. Okay, I'm going to go back because I want to read this passage from the report. Um, Lawyers for Equip for Equality said they, I think this is from your article, Lawyers for Equip, Equip for Equality said they reviewed more than 500 incident reports and found that them lacking critical information such as the type of restraint used, the length of restraint, and de de detailed descriptions of the injuries happening during the incident. What the hell? I'm going to go to you, Kelly, on this. And I'm going to, it's not to you, really, but like, what the hell is in the report if that stuff is missing? Like, you're just like turning in like a, a, a blank piece of paper. Like, what's on these reports if this is what Equip found? Right. And, and I think that was the biggest complaint from the chief judge about Equip for Equality's investigation is that they relied a lot on interviews. Um, and, and they say that in the report. They talk to kids inside. They also talk to staff. Um, if we publish the report in the article, so you can actually see some of the quotes that they got from, from staff and youth, but some of the stuff that they, that they're hearing is, I mean, it's, it's just wild. Um, I think, um, here, I'm going to, you know, pull it up as well. Cause some of these quotes are, um, you know, at, at some point one kid said, you know, I feel like they, they treat us like dogs, um, and, and, and they make a point about this in the report as well. At Crip for Equality, they say that, um, the sitting on the wall practice, for example, is not something that was inside a policy manual or the handbook or anything, um, which is another way that they conceal um, a lot of these incidents is that, like um, Carlos said earlier, it's it's a game of schematics. Like they um, don't consider what they're doing as solitary confinement or as um, abuse of any form or as restraint because they consider it a behavioral modification plan, right? Um, and so that's what makes it hard too, is that you don't only, you not only don't have access to the data, um, but also the way that we refer to the different incidents varies, um, especially across attention centers. And so it's really hard to figure out what's happening inside. And so that's why investigators had to rely on interviews. Um, they, I think they did, you know, they were able to access some files, but um, and some reports from staff. But again, um, you know, Leonard Dixon himself, um, like, denied like blanket denied like all of the allegations inside the report um he literally said they were uh like it was like misinformation that like none of it was accurate um the chief judge um did acknowledge he like acknowledged that the sitting on the wall practice was real um he just didn't you know he didn't say that it was as egregious as it sounds he just says yeah they sit in a chair and they you know they work on their behavior modification plan um, but being in that chair is for 15 days is rare, you know, so it's like it, it they I don't even think agree on like what's really happening inside because I don't think they really want to admit what, what what's happening. But um, yeah. Yeah, if we had any accountability in the system, the superintendent would have been fired. Well, he might have been fired a long time ago, but he had at least been fired when Equip for Equality's report came out. You got to go. Because some has got a role, and it's going to be yours. That's what you're there for. Because it ain't going to be me, the chief judge. It's going to be you. Um, but the fact that they're not um, growing resources, uh, mental health, and other forms of, of help to these kids immediately upon entry shows you um, they're thinking about what that facility is and why it exists. Um, because this should be... Like, I am against detention unless we cannot stop the person 
committing violence. If they can't be, if that can't be stopped somehow, then I, I'm, I'm for, unfortunately for detention to some degree. That said, we should be doing everything we can when we have people detained to help them make whatever changes they need to make in their lives, um, to leave better than they came in. That should be our goal. Um, here, it just seems to keep them um, obedient while they're in. And it's just sad. So I'm going to quote again from your report, and I'm going to go to Carlos on this. There was spokesman. This is 2023, ladies and gentlemen. You heard uh, Kelly and Carlos talk about all the reports that came before this and inspections and whatever, and the report from the reporter, right? This is what Evan said through a spokesman. Intensive, the judge has ordered intensive training on the appropriate use of force. How the hell in 2023 do the people in this correctional facility haven't been trained on the appropriate use of force? It's a good question. I mean, and, and you know, actually now now you ask it that way, I wish we had followed up with the chief judge's office to ask, you know, directly, does this mean, you know, have they not been trained before? Yeah. I'm guessing they would say they have. Uh, it's just we're going to train them better this time or something. Right, so they didn't um, follow the rules, so fire them. Who's getting fired? Yeah, um, I, I, again, all great all great questions. And, I, and again, like the lack of transparency here makes – makes it so hard because we're dependent on the chief judge releasing information and the experience, uh, not only from us, but from other reporters in other places and in, in years past has been uh, not to get everything they asked for. And, and because they're not compelled to give it to us by law through FOIA, um, we're at their whim. And so it's very difficult to know exactly what's going on and, and, and the, the, the response to these reports to your point about Dixon being fired, I mean, it seems like the chief judge is willing to stick by Leonard Dixon. Again, this is like maybe I think my, by my count, the third report of its kind to come out from different from a different organization in like three years that calls out the the JTTC in some shape or form. So um, who knows? Maybe by the fourth one, um, the chief judge will change his mind. <laughs> I'm just it's very um, it's it's very to me it goes against he can't be voted out how do you let someone run or oversee right. a, a a correctional center who can't be voted out who can't see the repercussions of it like as long as he keeps his other right. judges happy he's in for life i i think the other thing too i'll i'll, I'll mention this is that you know we're talking about youth who are oftentimes very troubled have a lot to do with a lot to deal with in their in their lives uh uh a lot, many are homeless or, and have a disability often come from broken homes so you know and there isn't i think a a lot of attention paid to them from for example the county commissioners who could easily uh you know bash uh like ask for more results or clamor for more changes at the JTDC, but you know, it's a constituent young people that unfortunately um, are disregarded and thought of as criminals by a lot of folks. So uh, I think the appetite for change, while for some, you know, reading these reports like us, we're like, whoa, what the hell? This is really important. Unfortunately, I feel like for a lot of people, that's, that's not the case. Okay, I'm going to last question to Kelly, and uh, I'm not sure as journalists you can answer this, but I'll answer it after you. I'm going to give you the opportunity. I mean, the takeaway for me seems the JTDC sucks, and Evans doesn't feel any need to make the massive changes that need to be done. So should the Cook County Board just close this thing? I guess that's my question. Well, that's what advocates are saying, right? Um, and is it, you know, the the question I would pose back to you is, I mean, yeah, if the detention center isn't reducing um, or at least helping kids rehabilitate after, well, then what exactly is it doing? Is it just, you know, re-traumatizing the kids that it's it's detaining? Is it, um, you know, I, I remember the, the uh, BJ policy released another uh, report recently that said, you know, in, in a lot of these cases these kids are just going to grow up to become adults 
um, in Cook County Jail, right? So you're in, it, this is a cycle that they're entering at the juvenile detention center. Um, so a lot of people have argued for years that it should close. And the power does, you know, lie, I think, on on the chief judge. It also lies on lawmakers. They can decide on who uh, oversees the JTDC. It wasn't always the chief judge. It used to be the, the board president, Tony Preckwinkle. Um, and so, you know, it, it's possible. I do see it as a possibility that I can close. Um, but I'll let you answer that question, Tracy. What do you think? Um, I think it's got to go. And my answer is it's got to go. And it's certainly, if it doesn't just completely shut down, it's definitely got to be taken away from the chief judge. Having it under people that aren't really accountable to the voters um, was a horrible, horrible, horrible mistake. And I know years and years ago, the JTDC was known under, um, God, Todd Stroger. Under Stroger and then Todd Stroger was known for a dumping ground. He would just put political hacks that it couldn't do any other job at the JTDC. That was known, and I know it was investigated by the feds also um, when they were investigating Todd um, and all his misdealings, that they just put the most incompetent people there because they thought, well, you're basically just a jail guard. Um, so who needs competency there, right? <laughs> I guess if you need to find a patronage job and you can't put them anywhere else in county government, that's where you want to put them. It just says so much about our county's things and everything in our government. It's so sad. Um, but we have to find a solution. And if we can't find one, it does seem back to me the judge is um, either too incompetent or doesn't care enough to make the changes that need to be made. So it's either got to be taken out from underneath them. And if he protests, then defund it, whatever it's got to be done. Because um, and like I'm a report guy. I like investigations. I like reports. I think the work you guys have done here is awesome. Please keep the spotlight on it. Um, but it obviously isn't moving. The, it isn't enough to move the needle. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think sticking a kid in there for 30 days or longer and putting them on the wall for five or 10 days and isolating them is making them better so that, hey, they're less likely to hood. They're less likely to reoffend when they get out. Um, as an activist, it's just very frustrating. Uh, once again, you, Carlos and Kelly, uh, thank you for jumping on. Really appreciate it. The reporting's awesome. Um, please keep uh, an eye, shine a light on that JTDC. We all need it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks again to Kelly and Carlos. Really appreciate them taking the time to discuss their coverage of the J JTDC. You know, some of the work has been great. The reality is, the JTDC leadership views themselves as jailers, nothing more. And that's a problem. They don't have the report. I mean, report after report after report now document all these problems. They don't document when they put people into restraints, how long they put them up on the wall, if there's any injuries from any of the interactions with that roving team ridiculous that should have been enough to just gut the leadership right there but no it's cook county you know illinois of course that doesn't happen if we had a real u.s attorney in the, in the u.s attorney's office of the northern district of illinois he would probably come in and step in i don't know why the justice department they're doing all these um consent decrees about local police departments why aren't they taking over jails and prisons that are run amok right it should probably be scraped, scrapped, right? Get rid of, got rid of, done, history eliminated. I doubt communities could do worse. There's probably a need for multiple small facilities with intensive intervention is what's probably ideal. Interventions, mental health therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, education, tutoring, getting them up to grade as best we can. And finding the best ways to assimilate them back or as best into the communities and society as we possibly can. We have to focus, if we have these facilities at all, we have to focus on the individuals come in. When they come in, they're almost guaranteed to go out better than they came in. Leaving teenagers and children in solitary confinement 
for what t- minimum 12 hours a day 7 p.m to 7 a.m sleeping hours kids don't sleep that much but let's say they do you're leaving them in coverage at least that and then there's hour every time there's a shift change so it's at least once probably twice during the rest of the time from 7 a.m to 7 p.m so it's what 14 hours of lockdown and they're basically all in solitary confinement because they're in individual cells housing facility however you want to say it right they're in these little tiers with a bunch of other people, but in the cells themselves are an individual. So it's at least 14 hours a day in solitary, basically solitary confinement because it's forced. They're not going to go through that and come out better than they came in. It's just a fundamental misunderstanding of what needs to be done in these facilities. And we're not going to get there with the leadership that there. That's quite obvious, right? They've shown that time and time again. All the reports are wrong. They don't understand. You know, it's not that bad. And they can they can uh, try to talk their way around every single um, every single report. How many reports do we need? How many reports? Um, the fact that the leadership has kept their job is mind boggling. They have to go. Okay. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Really appreciate it. Once again, check out our YouTube channel. If you're not watching this on YouTube, you listen to the podcast, check out our YouTube channel where we are pumping content there probably a couple times a week, at least besides just the podcast video that's you're be watching or you're listening that is up there every week. Also, we really appreciate your time. Please like and subscribe all over the place. Please visit our Patreon and support our work. We'd really appreciate it. Thanks again. Hopefully I'll be back with you next week.